So let's go ahead and start a prayer, and then we'll go to our next. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come together. And Lord, I know we still have a ways towards Christmas, but I pray that you would start warming our hearts to get ready to sing these songs, to proclaim the good news, to, to touch this world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray you meet our discussions today, for in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. How many of y'all have a nativity scene at your house? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. We have. We always have one. It's. Uh, we actually now get this. It was from the very first Christmas. Denise and I share. It's the same one we have. It's a porcelain set. Uh, now, what's funny about this one is that I believe the angel is missing her hand, uh, and then Joseph is missing something too. I forgot what he's missing, but. <laughs> But so they're broke, but we just love them. You know, it's just that one thing. They're they're not the best. We got it at Walmart, so they're kind of ugly. It's, it's not I say porcelain. It's the cheap Walmart porcelain. And, uh, but it's uh, we we love it. So I'm going to show you a picture of this nativ nativity scene, and y'all tell me what you think about it. What y'all think? How's it works good? Looks good. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Something missing. Do y'all see anything special about this? A, a visitor? No, a or something. Okay, see. Hi, Joe. Huh? Hi, Joe. No? No. Oh. I'm sitting too far away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it's kind of hard to see. Yes. What? Each of them. Yoda has been invited oh. to the nativity scene. <laughs> There's a Yoda. Oh, uh, my <laughs> this is one of those pranks that kids pull, and I pull it at my house uh, with my wife. Uh, you add your little toy figures to the nativity scenes to see if anybody notices. Uh, <laughs> and so this was a guy who did this for his for his, his mom, and he put it in there. And, and the little skit is that going on 13 weeks, mom still hasn't noticed. <laughs> Nativity, but some of our favorite Christmas carols have a baby Yoda. <laughs> they have characters or parts of the Nativity story that are not in the Bible that we have added to those. And so they're fictional elements added to the gospel story. Uh, we, as you know, you hear people say this. Uh, there's a whole genre of books called historical fiction. And, and I love to read historical fiction where you're like, this could really be true. <laughs> you know? And, and so there's a couple things that when you're looking at just the difference between fiction and historical fiction, there's a couple things that sep um, separate them. First of all is, is it consistent with the overall narrative of the story? So for example, how many of y'all have seen the movie Titanic? Yeah? I hate it. <laughs> it's such a, a gooey little love thing. And, uh, and I think it's actually it's a murder story because there was enough room on that thing for two people to get on. So I think she deliberately killed him. Uh, so <laughs> just my my few cents. <laughs> but do y'all think that that is fact or fiction about the story between uh, Jack and whatever, Rose, Jack and Rose? Oh. It's fiction, right? Sure. It's, it's fiction, but could you see that happening on the Titanic? And does that take away from the story of the Titanic? Now, if you have Jack all of a sudden be able to fix the boat to where it doesn't sink, then you're like, this changes everything, right? It takes away from the story of Titanic. So, so this is a fictional element placed within this real story, okay? So when we sing a Christmas carol, you can add fictional elements to it as long as you don't take away from the actual Christmas story. 
Okay, because we're, we're going to read stories tonight like the little drummer boy. Was he there? No. <laughs> but could he have been? Yes, yes. Second of all, do you clearly know it's a fictional edition? Okay? So, when you read this, you understand, when you sing these songs, do you realize that this is not biblical, it's actually fiction, and there's no qualms about it? For example, uh, when I was a kid, one of my favorite Christmas cartoons, well, a couple of Christmas cartoons we watch all the time, The Year About Santa Santa Claus, by far the best, Charlie Brown Christmas and everything, but y'all remember Nestor the Long-Eared Donkey? Yeah. <laughs> okay? Y'all y'all never? Oh my Okay, we're about to watch that now. <laughs> Don't remember that one. Yeah. Basically, it's a story about this donkey who is ne his name's ne ne uh, Nestor, long ears, outcast, but he gets to be part of state. And it's a beautiful little story and it ties into Jesus. But, you know, if you're going to look at your nativity scene and say, well, where's the long-eared donkey at? <laughs> you, you know you're not going to find him, right? So you understand that. And the third thing is it doesn't take away from the meaning of the story, okay? Um, for example, how many of y'all watched The Chosen? The Chosen, beautiful story. There are so many uh, liberties they are taking with the gospel story. Because the Bible is a, it's not an elongated history. It is very concise, and so it will say, Jesus spoke. Period. You know, Jesus met this person. Jesus did this. Da -da -da. The chosen will add things to make it a longer story. And to, to what we're going to talk about is you use your sanctified imagination to imagine what would this interaction be like. What, what would that conversation be like, you know? For example, in the Gospels, when we talk about Matthew, all we know is that Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew said this. Do we learn anything about Matthew's personality? No. He is just Matthew. You watch The Chosen. He has autism. <laughs> you know, you're like, what happened? How did Matthew get that? But it fits perfectly in seeing that to where you understand. He was a task collector. He was a numbers guy. This all fits perfectly. Okay? But other times you'll read other fiction books. For example, y'all remember when Dan Brown wrote his book, The Da Vinci Code? It tried to completely change the story. And so that, that, that wasn't necessarily what we would say good historical fiction. So, when we talk about these, what we call these biblical embellishments, uh, the good part about them is it gets to fill in the gaps. Okay? You get to fill in gaps of certain things. We talk about the chosen, but even with the Christmas songs. You know, because really, when you talk about the, the Timmy scene, here's what we know Mary gave birth to baby, to Jesus. The shepherds saw the angels. The Magi came two years later, you know, roughly, so we know that. But what was that first night like? You know, we really don't know. What animals were there? The Bible doesn't say anything about animals. Okay? So all these little the heavy things, we don't know. You know, we don't know. In fact, even what it says about, you know, there's a debate about the hay. Was there hay? No, nope. it doesn't say. So if you're one of these, these folks who everything has to be literally exactly as it is in the Bible, the songs we're going to sing today will drive you crazy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they will drive you crazy. But if you use your sanctified imagination and say, okay, how can I tell a story that adds to the story, but doesn't take away from the story. To tell a story. <laughs> make, make sense? Okay, so look at that. Note but the hard part that comes with this is when you get confused with what is actually part of the true story and what is not. 
So if you grew up your whole life and you never opened the Bible, you never went to church, you never saw the Timmy scene, and you look at this and someone says, what's missing? You say, where's the little Jonah boy? He was there. I see him every Christmas. You say, no, 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 that's not an actual part of the story, okay? And so Christmas carols are actually notorious for doing that. So the ones we're going to look at this evening are two stories, The Little Drummer Boy and Away in a Manger, okay? Now, a lot of y'all think, Away in a Manger, wait a minute, that's not, that doesn't add anything to it. It does. It does. So we're going to talk more about that. So, tonight we want to talk about, now I'm do this. What are your memories when I say little drummer boy? What is, what memories? Because one of the best things about Christmas carols is the memories that are attached to them. Okay? For example, when I say, when you start saying silent night, my first thought of mind goes to Christmas Eve. And when everybody has their candles lit. That most one of the most magical moments of the entire year. I love it. And y'all have not been to a Christmas Eve service, don't miss it. It is Power. We love it. Um, but little, little drum number boy, what comes up in, in y'all's mind? Andy Williams Christmas special. <laughs> 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 yeah. What was that there? A movie made about it or the picture did? There, there is a stop motion um, car, cartoon made about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, but it's a celebration. Celebration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think about some elementary school play, yeah. Like yeah. program or something. Yeah. And and what's amazing, we're talking about that about elementary school because the woman who wrote it taught at a college, and she actually wrote this song as a way for a girls choir, and it's meant for beginning choirs. I always thought it was a big complex song. But it's supposed to be where, and, and y'all choir ladies and guys can tell me more, <laughs> where you have, it's supposed to be a soprano, but then you have where they can sing their songs, but then the altos come in, and then you have your bass, but they're all easily separated, <clears throat> and to where they have different parts, so it's not complicated. And I was like, it sounds complicated to me. <laughs> so, but this is one of those songs where, you know, as a pastor, and, all, and this is where I get to all these different religious things. Um, as a pastor, you're supposed to not like this because this is not a biblical song. But it's one of my favorite songs. I remember this as a kid simply for one thing. <laughs> and that was just one of those things. It was just, I love that. I, I'm a sucker for bass voices. And I love it when you have a deep bass doing the and just going like that. And so I love this song. So, a couple things about the story behind the song. Uh, the woman who wrote this, her name was Kathleen Davis. And she was a music instructor. And she uh, wrote over 800, I believe, tunes that she did. But this was one that she just could not get out of her head. She had been listening to a French carol called the Patapan. And the Patapan is a song about a shepherd with a drum. And it's, a, it's supposed to be, a, the Patapan means playing your, your, your drum. And so she just kept singing that patapan, 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 patapan. And she was trying to go to sleep. But have y'all ever had that experience to where you have a song stuck in your head and you can't get it out of your head and you're trying to go to sleep and you lay in bed? Patapan, patapan. <laughs> <laughs> but from that patapan, she came up with a tune. Bada -ba -ba. You know, if you've ever wondered why is it pa 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 starts with P, you know, because it's pat a pan, and that's how she started it. And so she 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 got the tune right away, and so she had that in her mind, just 
And she said that the next day didn't take no time for the words just to come. And so she just put this down to words. Now, she did not really um, send the song out. She um, just basically had her choir do it, not a big deal. But you know how these things go? Someone hears it, picks up on it. It started off called the Carol of the Drums. So it wasn't the Little Drummer Boy, it was the Carol of the Drums. It got picked up by this Serbian group. And the Serbian group started playing it, and they kind of, you know, got it going. But then, and I forgot the name of the big, uh, is it Harry Simeon? Uh, Y'all remember the, the orchestra, the big famous orchestra of the 50s? Uh, there were several. Yeah, there were several, but they, they heard it and they loved it. And so, but it was one of those things where it was, who actually wrote it? And finally someone said to her, said, hey, you know that song you wrote? They're playing on the radio. And so they're like, okay, that's my song. And so there was this little, little bit of a dispute about who, who actually wrote the song, but she had a thing. She actually wrote it. And so it's just one of those simple, simple songs. Oh, I forgot to show you all. This is a lady who, who wrote it in her younger days. Okay. What year was that? Uh, eight, in 1941, I believe, is when she wrote it. 1941. 41. So, so it, it's a fairly new song. Fairly new song. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now, let, let's look at some of the, the theology of this. So, if I ask you, if I said, okay, tell me what is the little drummer boy about? Please don't say it's a little drum drummer boy. It's about a little, a little boy who plays on a drum. <laughs> Giving a gift to his right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. The only gift he has. The only gift he has. Yes. It's about, and this is where I love it, you know, it's a poor boy. He doesn't have anything. And, and, and he talks to Jesus, you know, I am a poor boy too. And you get to see a little bit of the humility of Jesus. You know, the, the, um, the, the, what we call the kenosis of Jesus, the empty of Jesus, where he made himself nothing. And he is nothing. And this little boy, you know, the, the, uh, the image that's given is like the Magi invite this young boy to come. Hey, we're bringing gifts to the new Lord King. You want to come? And he's like, yeah, but what can I give? What can I give? Jesus. And, and, and I love if you, and this is where you start to think deeper about these songs. How many times have we felt the same way? What, who am I to offer him anything? What, what can I give to him? What is anything that, that I have that he would like? And what did this young boy have? Yeah, he had a song. And notice that he doesn't go and give his drum to Jesus. We always think about gifts in a material sense, right? I will give you everything, which, you know, we're supposed to give God stuff. But this is a gift he was giving to Jesus. It was his talent. And, and, and we're going to talk amongst each other here in a moment. Uh, nothing, but I want y'all to be thinking about what talents do you feel like you can offer to Jesus as a gift to him? Now, of course, we don't have a little baby in a stall somewhere. But how do we give to Jesus with our talents today? Jesus said, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. So when you serve and you give to others, you're giving to him. And you say, what can I do? What, what can I give? Well, you have everything to give. And it's a gift to give. And so, so let, let, let us look real, real quick through these uh, verses. Okay? And then 
we're going to talk about it, then we're going to try to sing, okay? But we don't have our choir leaders today, so yeah, well, Connie can help us. Sing <laughs> John. Sing John. Yeah. 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 I'm playing choir and drum. One hand. Uh, One hand. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so let's look at these things. So the, the come they told me. So we're thinking about the mag magi giving gifts. Um, but also there's a sense of evangelism. Hey, come with me. I, I'm doing this for the Lord. Come follow me. Come with me. And, and just as a little thing about church growth, uh, there are a lot of folks who will never step foot in the doors of a church. But if you ask them to serve alongside with you outside of the community, they will come. And that is their gateway into the church. Ask them to come and give with you, to serve with you. And people will do that. Uh, a newborn king to see, so you get Jesus, not just a baby, but a king, royalty. Our finest gifts we bring. Now, think about if you're a little drummer boy, how does that make you feel? I'll tell you, uh, Saturday we had our Lord, Lord's Anchor. Um, when they started, I think it was what I told my wife, I said, hey, don't bid on anything. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a football. <laughs> it's signed by Michael Parsons. <laughs> You, we can go up to $100. <laughs> I thought we'd be generous. <laughs> Starting bid, $300. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, but when you see everybody else, and so you, like, you know, for, for example, if you're like, um, you hear Haleani or Tuki get up there and sing. And such angelic voices. And then they say, hey, would you come and sing in the choir? Mm -hmm. Well, they had to ask me, but who knew what they did? <laughs> Compared to that? Who am I to do that? And you often feel inferior. And, and that's not just in the choir. That's, how, how many times have you all been in a Bible study where you feel like everybody around you knows everything about the Bible? And you're like, I don't want to say anything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> You feel inferior. To lay before the king, so to honor him. What is the purpose of the gift? Honor. To honor. Not so you can tell everybody, look how much I did, look at the gift I gave. You know, you don't toot your own horn. It's to honor him. Okay? Little baby, I am a poor boy too. We do not have a high priest who is unsympathetic to our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in every way as we are. We're going to talk a little bit about this, but especially when we get to a way of anger. How will we truly start to think about the implications of the incarnation? Um, how uncomfortable that is. That Jesus is fully human. I mean, uh, it may sound... Um, almost sacrilege or like for being blasphemous. But can you imagine Jesus in a dirty diaper? Can you imagine Jesus burping up on Mary? We say, no, that would never happen. Why not? He's a baby. Human. He was human. And that's one of the great things when you start to when you start to truly think about what, they do, what this means, how Jesus is fully human, it means there is nothing that you have experienced that he has not experienced himself. Max Hader once wrote a book about this, and one of the things he said, and I, I, it hit me everything. I was like, yeah, yeah, I get that. So he said, Jesus going through puberty. And I thought, Jesus with a pimple. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said, I can't go to synagogue today. <laughs> it's not my <laughs> um, But those things, Jesus fully human. I, I, I just get blown away by that. That Christmas.
Christmas is one of my favorite times of the year, and I just uh, he made himself enough. Um, but I'm a poor boy too. And that's where you think about it. Of all the ways that Jesus could have come to this world, he could have come born in a mansion, born to rich parents, but no, he came to poor parents. The most humblest. I mean, even when he's born, it's in a barn. I mean, it's, it's just wrap your mind around that. And this psalm sets, sets that for us. I have no gift to bring that's fit to give a king. Who am I? But if you think about it, go back to what you see in the Gospels. What people gave Jesus, what was it worth in the world's eyes compared to what it was worth to Jesus? What did Jesus use to feed the 5,000? A little boy's lunch. What did he have? Nothing. Sack lunch. But look what Jesus did. Okay? Um, shall I play for you on my drum? Okay? Now, this is where a lot of folks will say this is fiction because if you have a mom who just gave birth to a newborn <laughs> baby, they <laughs> 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 She said, don't you dare touch that. <laughs> um, Mary nodded. You know, powerful. The ox and lamb kept time, okay? Again, we have no, no idea there are ox and lamb inside there. But um, now I'm picturing, you know, the animals hitting their books, you know? <laughs> Keep in time. Um, I played my drum for him, and I love this. I played my best for him. And this was his gift. Um, have you ever watched a little kid, you know, when, when they are putting on a show for you, and they're doing, you know, you know, mommy, watch, watch me, daddy, watch me, watch me. And they are so proud of themselves. And you're like, Ugh. <laughs> But really, it just warms your heart. Because you know they gave their very best. And look at the response. This is the part we all miss. Then he smiled at me. Um, have you ever thought, you know, when, when you hear someone get up, let's just use Sunday morning. They get up and they get up there and they give their very best. And, and it could sound like, you know, nails on the talk or to us. <laughs> you know. But... Can you imagine God on his throne, sitting there smiling and saying, I accept that worship. Thank you. How beautiful that is. Imagine God smiling at us. Okay? So, did y'all want to do table talk first or sing first? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll take one. There you go. Let's sing, okay? And Connie, would you be so kind to help us, lead us? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So here, here's what I thought we would do. Ladies, y'all sing the white part. Guys, we get the drum part. <laughs> okay. Okay? Okay, so. <clears throat> Come and hold me
take, because our time's going to run out, uh, how about I just ask this to the whole group? Okay. 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 So, what gifts do you feel like you have to give to Jesus this Christmas? Some of us are blessed to be able to sing in the choir. Mm -hmm. uh, just, yeah. It's like playing our music. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we talked about that uh, there in our finance meeting where we give our praises and that Linda, that y'all was all saying to, to, to Linda how beautiful that was. Yes. And while we did that, we took a blanket from Stitching Angels mm -hmm. and we took balloons. And, I mean, many people had a part. <coughs> yeah, and so there's nothing, the Stitching mm -hmm. Angels, what you can give, you know, you have a talent, right. sewing. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I had a talent, but it kind of blew up on me. <laughs> <laughs> I was helping the little girl at Rachel Brass's with her homework, mm -hmm. and then this week she came and said, Look, I got a dear. We got an answer, but we didn't do it the way the stars <laughs> 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 she learned a valuable lesson. Yes, yes. do no. your own work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm in a Bible study on Wednesday night, mm -hmm. it's usually yeah. every Wednesday after this. Yeah. But we uh, we heard that there was several in the nursing home that didn't get Christmas gifts. And so we're adopting, we have a man right now, we're, we're, we have his list and we're trying to get it. Oh, that's good. Cool. So we're, we're going to go after another one, I think. Well, our church is going to be doing that too. We're going to have our angel tree yeah. Yeah. as nursing home residents. Yeah. Well, this, um, evidently this guy doesn't ever ask for any help or anything. Yeah. And he just wants the things, I mean, his list is so simple. Mm -hmm. It's just things we take for granted, like yeah. dish soap. Yes. You know, in his apartment, things like that. Yeah. Little things. Uh-huh. Yeah. So we're going to make a deal and wrap them all and put some extra stuff in there for him. That's, see, that's good. That's, you know, and little things like that, just the kind work. You know, you think I, you all know how much that means when you just say something nice to someone. And, and a blessing, that is. I didn't realize how many in the nursing home don't have anybody come see him. Every year, the Stitching Angels put a package together for the nursing homes. We put a blanket in it, a teddy bear in it, uh -huh. and this year we're going to put a coloring book in it mm -hmm. with the colors, something that, for them to do, but we've done this for years to all the nursing homes. Wow, my, my mom was in the nursing home last part of her life, uh -huh. and one of her favorite things, and she carried it with her everywhere she went was her stuffed animal. Oh, I mean, and my daughter wow. said, oh, it's so cute. She said, but you can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> she loved her little animal. Yeah. I think she thought it was a baby. After yeah. Her. Yeah. 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 Let me ask, um, have y'all ever felt like, uh, well, I think I skipped that one about feeling like the gifts were insignificant, but have you ever considered Jesus smiling at your gifts? So, so think about like, like when, when, when you give that gift to the yeah. person, Jesus on his throne is smiling at you. Or when you offer that kind word, or on Sunday, when you give your gift of worship. You know, one reason why it's so important for us to sing on Sundays. You know, not just mumble, just but sing. You're giving your best to God. Who mumbles? No. By the way, it says make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise, yeah. I'll tell you what, Robert, one day I'm going to have Noah put a camera up on the stage to look out. And we can scan the audience, <laughs> see who's singing and who's... We can tell you. You can tell the choir. <laughs> we all write it down. We got, we got the name of all seven of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the idea about God smiling on us, and, and I 
I will say this, this is one of my soapbox things. Um, we are so accustomed to thinking about God looking at us through a judgmental lens to where we are, that we think God is looking at us waiting for us to mess up. And God only sees the things we do wrong. We don't think of God looking at us the 99 times we did something right. Or the 99 times we had the opportunity to do wrong and didn't. And him smiling at us saying, I'm proud of you. Great job. Yeah. And I think that that's a wonderful change our image of how God sees us. And it's a beautiful thing. Okay? Um, what else stands out to you all about this song? Hey, when I was a child, I loved this song. Yeah. So it did something for me then. As I grew older, my passion for it faded somewhat. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you why, yeah. but I came to like Silent Night and the kind like that more. Yeah. So I don't know, but uh, it was a gift to me, mm -hmm. even if it's still yeah. not given. But it was. It did once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know, there's songs are gifts. Like you said, that there's, and when we said that, songs can touch you in ways that other things can't. It just impacts us. I think the simplicity of it mm -hmm. that you can just bring it up at any time yeah. is. Well, we sang it over and over again when I was a child, and everybody, the kids all marched to the yeah. beat and everything mm -hmm. else. And it was just like he's got the whole world in his hands. I mean, we yeah. would go around singing that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, as a child, and I don't sing it now. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's such a like a simple, beautiful song, and the idea, and and when you look at the message behind it, it's so beautiful. It's so catchy. Little, it's catchy. Yes. Yeah, the pump up, the Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I remember about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a catchy, you know, those kids singing those, yeah. oh, 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 oh. Yeah. <laughs> Now, one thing I will take my stand, David Bowie has no business being with Bing Crosby singing a song. <laughs> 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 yeah. I wouldn't get on Savannah as a huge David Bowie fan. Uh -huh. And so I'm like, no, David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so because of our time, I just want to go through this pretty quick. Uh, but when I was a kid, one of my favorite songs was A Way of Danger uh, because I got to sing in the school choir. I'll tell Pollyani that when I was a kid, I got to sing in the school choir. And this was our first, it was this, and there's no song called Me and My Teddy Bear. And we all dress in our pajamas, we all have teddy bears. I still have that teddy bear <laughs> in my house. Uh, but Away in Danger is such a simple song. Now, who wrote the song Away in the Name in Danger? Up till recently, you would have been told it was Martin Luther. But it wasn't Martin Luther. Um, they said that a way of danger was an ancient German carol. Problem was, it's not in any ancient German uh, <laughs> hymn books or stories. And if you follow the melody, and I don't understand about melodies all that, but you can tell that it is a strictly American thing. And so it follows the American mel melody at the time. What they believe happened is that it was written by German Americans as, as a way to pay homage to German carols. And it was written at the time, I forgot the exact day, but it was the 400th anniversary of Martin Luther's birth. And so if y'all know how you get something famous, you attribute it to somebody famous. <laughs> you know? Uh, don't believe me? Go to any flea market, 
and you'll have, oh, this island belonged to you know, Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> yes. And so, uh, but uh, it, here's the, the first thing that we have. Uh, this was in a little newspaper clipping. It was called Luther's Cradle Song. And you see the following hymn composed by Martin Luther for his children is still sung by many of the German mothers to the little ones. Okay? But it wasn't. But it was attached. But it's amazing how quickly stories get connected to songs to where they became a song itself. And then uh, it goes on and on. But <laughs> let me get my little notes here. Um, the theology of the song is a very, very simple song. Okay? So let's look at the lyrics. Away in a main manger. Now, how much theology do you attribute to the word away? I have read whole sermons based upon away. Where, you know, Jesus, he was away from heaven. He was away from, you know, all he had in his glory. Um, but really, you know what away means? Over yonder. There, in the manger. Over there. Um, no crib for a bed, okay, which basically means he's born and born. So little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. And I've heard people complain about this because they say, how did you know what the weather was that night? How did you know the <laughs> You did not know that. Um, so little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay, okay? And I've heard other folks complain, said, uh, why would it be just simply on the hay? Why not in the hay? You know, if you put a baby in there, it's going to go around there. So, you know, technicalities. Same people who tell you, you know, and I'm guilty of this. Technically, the wise man wasn't at the manger scene, so you got to move your manger around. So, the cattle are lowing. Again, no cattle. And do cattle low? I thought they moved. <laughs> the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Okay, this is where uh, a lot of people have issues with this song. Because you almost have like this superhuman baby. You know? Counter-lowing, everything's going on motion. But how is baby Jesus reacting? You can almost picture the little halo, the little glow, <laughs> and just baby Jesus. How many of y'all been around an infant? <laughs> what does an infant do when it's startled? <laughs> it screams. It doesn't just cry, it screams. Okay? But notice as the song changes, it goes from a song about Jesus, but a song to Jesus. And I'll tell you, y'all know, but also when you read the Psalms, notice how many times the Psalms will make a transition. Uh, one of the things I love, Psalm 23, everybody's favorite song. Notice how you start off, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not go to He makes me he, 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 he. But when you get to the part of where you go through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It's no longer he, it's you. And, and, and it transitions to a prayer. So I love the Lord Jesus look down from the sky. Okay? So where is the baby now? He's up in heaven. He's up in heaven. Yeah. You know? The baby's glorified. Okay? And that's a reminder story. Uh, and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Um, this goes back, and this is back in this time frame. Um, it was believed that, I don't want to scare you about it, because I heard that some folks were spooked by the sermon on Sunday about death. <laughs> um, but that it was believed that at nighttime, children were closer to death than any other time. And so there was a superstition that, you know, you really needed God to watch over the kids. So when you say your, your bedtime prayers, do you all remember your the kids' prayers? Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord to sleep. So I should die before I wake. It was because it was, that was the common fault, was that when you were asleep, you were close to death. Now we know that that's sleep apnea. <laughs> but the neat thing is that 
start it off, there are only two verses to this. It wasn't until about 10 or 15 years later that a third verse was added to make it sound more like a prayer. So be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to stay. Close by me forever, love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Now think about just the theology that's in that last part. Um, bless all of your children, get that. But what's it mean to fit us for heaven? How do we get to heaven? Through Jesus. How did he make that possible? The cross. This is a gospel presentation. <coughs> and so this little children's song has all these opportunities for you to, to go up. So our, our time is almost up, but I was going to say this. Let's ask this question. Um, why are we so often to clean up the stable and to make Jesus less than human? So why doesn't he want a super baby that doesn't cry? Then maybe it does. To make him special. To make him special. To make him immune from all the things that we go through. You know? To make it... I'll tell you, uh, one of the sermons, and you'll hear me preach this again, uh, when, when I talk about, uh, if we ever get to that, that passage uh, in Luke, where Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan. Um, that ties into Christmas. Because Jesus as our high priest, as one fully human, was being tempted by Satan the way you and I are, which means in order for him to be tempted by Satan, he had to actually have that possibility of giving in to the temptation. And some will say, no, that will never happen. Then you're missing the point of the incarnation. So, um, you see that wonderful thing and how this goes on, but we want to clean that up Set up, let's see. Do, 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 do. Well, we don't have time, but y'all, y'all have your notes, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but I do want to sing this because this was one thing. So um, we're all going to sing this together. So, Connie, would you? Yes. <laughs> oh,
you know? So, and, and then that goes for everything. One time, uh, I did a, ser ser a sermon about um, how sexualized our culture had been and had gotten. Because my girls were young and I was just fed up and lost up, and so I preached a sermon. And so uh, the, I, I got the number. And what started this is I read a quote by Robbie Zacharias. And he said, if you really want to know the pulse of a culture, don't look to the philosophers, look to the poets. Because that's where you're going to see how the culture thinks and feels. And he said, our modern day poets are songwriters. And so I thought, wow, that's powerful. And then I went and said, what's the number one song in America? And it was Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke. <laughs> and it was a dirty, raunchy song. Sure. And so if you want to know where the culture is, look at what the lyrics and song that people are singing. And, and that got me like, whoa, do people know what they are singing? And so that got me thinking about songs. And what really hit is, is I used to think about how wholesome songs were when I was growing up. I started, we started having a little dance party in our house and the Humpty Dance came on. <laughs> and I was like, oh, turn that off. Oh, turn that off. <laughs> and he realizes, not as wholesome as you remember. <laughs> so, but it's good to think, and, and also in worship songs, when you the slip, when you go through that was only something I missed about us reading hymnals is you can open a hymnal and look at the words. Now there are sometimes you may sing a song together, you're like I ain't singing that. <laughs> That's not my prayer. And so, but it's important to know the songs you sing. Okay. Anything else? All right, let's bow our hands. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for these songs. And Lord, I pray that you would put a song in our heart. Lord, I thank you so much for the new song we sing as Christians, the song of the redeemed. Uh, and Lord, as we come upon this Christmas time, Lord, I pray that you would just give us a sense of awe as we proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, be with us as we go forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.